adaptable church. Uh, it's modeling and please will change communication methodology. And what that means is that when churches face change, uh, a prime component of that is the communication of that change. And so that's what uh, the core uh, goal of this project is, is to investigate ways that churches communicate change. So we proceed here. The, uh, the format of tonight, we are going to go through six chapters. So after each chapter, I'll give a chance for you to have any questions you may have that uh, I can field and, and answer for you uh, concerning subject matter. And so we'll do a chapter and then questions and another chapter and questions. And then after chapter three and the question period, we'll do about a 10, 15 minute break. And then we'll come back and we'll finish uh, four, five, and six in the same format. So the problem ministry then that I'm addressing is that churches uh, need to seek the most effective means of making and developing disciples of Jesus Christ. And so we look at the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 19 and 20, it says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And so what the three churches in study endeavored to do was to obey the entire Great Commission, which means to make, develop disciples, and teach them God's commands. So churches then are commissioned to make disciples. They are commissioned to teach all that Jesus commanded. The approach to making disciples must be biblical. The approach must also be culturally relevant. To be or remain culturally relevant, churches must periodically change. The problem is that many churches are unwilling to change. And I'm going to list a little bit here the rationales for this dissertation. And they revolve around why churches are hesitant to change. So the dissertation presents three rationales. Uh, the first two present reasons some churches are unwilling to change. The latest, the last rationale suggests ways churches can prepare and implement change. So the first rationale is that some churches are willing to change because change is uncomfortable. Change brings an element of uncertainty, also brings an element of loss. So we'll look at that, look at that in a little bit here. So a quote from a book by Rainer and Steitzer, uh, as leaders we sometimes fool ourselves into thinking that just managing the status quo is good enough. Some leaders take the merry-go-round approach to church. They think that they just keep everyone moving, the flashing light shining bright, and the music happy, they won't get any complaints. Some leaders take the don't rock the boat approach. They think that if we all remain very still in the boat, it won't turn over, but it also won't go anywhere. Some churches are unwilling to change because they think there is no need to change. All is going well, so why do we want to risk change? The major challenge facing churches in the consolidation stage is to renew their mission and vision. The difficulty, of course, is that the entire church ministry is going so well that no one senses the need to change anything. And if it isn't broke, don't fix it. Mentality permeates every aspect of church ministry. There is a great danger at this point, speaking of this stage, in the con congregational life cycle, one pastor said, the saddest day in the life of a church is when it burns the mortgage papers. This pastor was referring to a loss of vision that often accompanies that stage, and this was by Barry McIntosh. Some churches are willing to change because 
they are uncertain where to begin. So rationale, the second one is change anxiety. So the uncertain where to begin, there is a fear of loss. There are fear of losing people, loss of identity, tradition, history, a loss of what was, a loss of ministry. So there is uncertainty, risk. Is it worth the risk? Is it going to be effective? The third rationale is a positive one, the acquisition of change acumen. Now, the acumen is not a word normally used in change methodology circles. Um, but acumen is the ability to effectively bring about an occurrence or situation. So change acumen then prepares the right environment for change that will bring the best results. Change acumen begins with asking the right questions. So in order to answer the right questions, there are some change presuppositions that frame those questions. Change must take a biblical approach. Change must seek the most effective way to make and develop disciples of Christ, of Jesus Christ. So biblical integrity and being culturally responsible or responsive would be the aspects or the characteristics of a transformational church. So transformation from spiritual death to life. Encouraging the transformation of everyone, progressive sanctification. So transformation then is an example or the pathway of transformation would be something like 2 Peter 1, 5 and 9. For this very reason, make every effort to su su supplement your faith with virtue and virtue of knowledge and knowledge of self-control and self-control of steadfastness and steadfastness with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. So in the prop uh, project methodology, the purpose is to discover communication methods used by churches that have successfully navigated extensive change. The methodology then will be qualitative descriptive research. And so qualitative would be describing, telling a story, describing an event rather than using numerical data. Um, although there is some numerical data, it is not the prime focus. The prime focus is describing what is happening. In this case, we're describing the types of methods churches use to navigate change. So, part of this methodology then is a theoretical model of change communication was developed. So, in the literature section, we will cover a great uh, some works, of representative works. Uh, we don't have time to do an exhaustive uh, explanation of all the works that I've read, but these are representative. And so from this research, then I, I formulated a model of change methodology uh, that was adopted or adapted to uh, the Please Deal Settings Church Settings. And so I use this model, this theoretical model, as a template with which to compare the change methods that churches use to see how well they match this theoretical template. And so this will be, I will have a thorough description of this when we uh, cover chapter four. Actually, more chapter five, seven and four. So models of change communication were developed from the research data for each church. These models were then compared to the theoretical model and to each other to see how similar they were. 
The research question then is, will the models of change communication methodology of the selective churches be similar to the theoretical model developed by the researcher of this project? So that's chapter one. Any questions that you might have? Uh, I have one, Tom, about your, uh, right towards the end, you were talking about the theoretical. Uh, so how did you select what that was going to look like and, and go that direction? I know you're going to explain it, what, like four or five, something like that. Yeah, chapter four and five, I'll explain uh, the model. Basically, the model is four phases. Right. So you made a comment, like last page, uh, and I'm not sure if I said theoretical is the right word. Uh, you had, you're working with a, you had, to pick, you had to pick something to make a, um, to make something, have something to compare to, right? So how did you pick that? How did you arrive at that? Because you had to have that before you got to four or five. Well, right. um, the model was created, the, the backbone actually came out of Everett Rogers' diffusion of innovation. Um, he had a 500 page work that was done on organizational change, actually societal change. So he took the approach of a sociologist and he would examine various communities. And he gave an example of, of a source of water, fresh water for a village. Uh, very remote, fairly primitive, somewhere, I think this was in somewhere in East India. Um, and he talks about that they dug a well and they, but they only had the resources to dig the well, put the pump in, and come up with a spigot. So a way that people can put buckets in and haul water back. The problem with this sort of change is that they presented and they, they did dug the well for them. They put a pump in them and, and for them and they put a water spigot out. And they were doing this for a while because previous to that they were getting it out of a ditch. It was really tepid, pretty scummy water, actually. And so what happened is that they started using this and that was really good, but he noticed later on that they went back to getting their water out of the ditch. And they, they were wondering, why did you, don't you do it, why don't you get your water from a fresh source? And they said, well, we don't know how to fix the pump, pump broke. And so associated with this change, they fell short with teaching them how to maintain the system. And so that was one that he gave them. But so Everett Rogers has this, uh, this formula or this model of change. How do you communicate change in a meaningful way? And so as we get into chapter four and five, uh, I will lay that out for you pretty uh, in, in some detail so you kind of get a grasp of what I'm, what I'm talking about. Okay, so maybe my question needs to wait. Because uh, what struck me is that you had to select some model, correct? Uh, I developed a model based you on, one yeah. You through, through all your study. Right, that's what so I showed what you're talking about now, or just in chapter one, is actually after findings uh, throughout your study. It's not at the beginning, and then let's see how this plays out. Well, yeah, it's just basically introdu introducing the format of the thesis and what the topic is and, 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 and the and that was achieved through in, into four and five, chapters four and five. Yeah. Okay. And, and, that, and that actually we get when we get to the literature section, it'll become a bit clearer yeah. as well. And uh, so that's coming. Cool. Hey, anybody else? Okay, we will uh, chapter two. Then this is uh, 
in, in the dissertation of this sort, uh, we, there's a chapter, chapter two, involves the theological and biblical reasons for the dissertation, the, the, uh, the theology uh, foundation. And so we're going to go in there, and, and you're going to probably look at something that's a little different than you would normally think. And so as we progress here, in the first section of the chapter, I, I talk about uh, from the synagogue to the New Testament church. How did Jesus prepare his disciples for change? And I don't know if you've thought of it this way, but the disciples were all Jewish right at first, or of the house of Israel. Their mode of worship was a synagogue. And not only was it worship, it was life. The synagogue was the cultural center of a Jewish settlement, a Jewish town. Everything revolved around the synagogue. Their teaching, their worship, uh, in fact, more teaching and more, if you would say, discipleship in the Jewish sense, in the Old Testament sense, it occurred around the synagogue. And how do you get then these disciples to look at a transition from the synagogue to the New Testament church where you have a combination, where you go multicultural? And so Jesus prepared his disciples not only for just instructing them and teaching them the meaning of scripture, but to get them ready for a multi multicultural setting where you had Gentiles coming in, and Gentiles were what? They were unclean to the Jews. And so how do you get them to unlearn that to fulfill the Great Commission? And so Jesus prepared his disciples for the cultural shift that they would experience as Gentiles and Israelites and would come together as a singular body of Christ. So in preparation for the ministry, the baptism of John, was, who was a forerunner of Jesus Christ, presented a new way of life not a cleansing from a particular uncleanliness. And this was the, the major difference in the baptism of John. Now, the baptism of John was not exactly the same as the baptism of Christ. The baptism of John was surrounded by repentance. Now, before Jews, if you, if you uh, are a student of Levit Levitical law, you will understand that there were various ways people became unclean that they would need to bathe. Uh, they would be unclean until evening, they would bathe and then they would be clean. And they bathed in a pool called a mikvah. And the mikvah had to have water running in and water running out. So it had to be fresh water, not stagnant. And so John departed from that. He was baptized in the Jordan, which was okay because it was running water. But he would baptize, it wasn't auto baptism, it wasn't bathing, it was different. It was a commissioning, it was a, a, a resignation to a formal way of life, an acceptance of a new way of life. And so John prepared the change that Jesus would later culminate towards the end of his ministry and then uh, further actually uh, it was it was an ongoing process Jesus prepared his disciples until he was taken up into heaven and then you had the commission of the Holy Spirit so where Jesus left off the Holy Spirit joined and empowered these disciples but you see in Acts repeatedly they remember when Jesus would instruct them. Even towards the end of the Gospels, they remembered when Jesus would give them this lesson. So they took this, and all this instruction prepared them for the transition. 
So the baptism of Christ then represented an identification of his death, burial, and resurrection, which made possible a new life in Christ. So what happened here is that it was still, repentance, of course, is still the uh, uh, a key component, right, in salvation. Repentance, you're turning away from and forsaking sin, and you're embracing following Christ and following his commands. And so the baptism actually illustrated how you're able to do that. Why are you cleansed from your sin? You're cleansed because of this death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So that presented a clearer picture than John's baptism did. So John was a forerunner, it, it, much like a herald would be in front of royalty that so often happened, uh, or happened anyway in the, in the New Old and New Testaments. And so they understood that. And so they understood the significance of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ and what baptism meant. So Jesus chose men of ordinary occupations. And why did he do that? As we will learn later on, Jesus uh, commissioned ordinary people, not necessarily scholars, not necessarily royalty, because he wanted paths to the people. And the most familiar path you can have are ordinary people to reach ordinary, other ordinary people. So it, the communication lines were already established with the Jews, they just had to transition over to the Gentiles. So Jesus separated the word of God from tradition. So trying to get them to concentrate on the word of God, tradition carried a lot of cultural overtones, and so the New Testament church needed to be rid of this baggage to Concentrate on what were the commands in the Word of God. Jesus demonstrated he was the Son of God by the testimony of demons cast out, miracles he performed, and his teaching, especially parables. You will notice two things that are happening here is that Jesus is establishing communication lines of familiarity and trust. Trust in that he is demonstrating who he says he is. And this becomes two very primary components in communication channels of change, trust and familiarity. We'll go more of that in a little bit. Jesus demonstrated servant leadership that contrasted the leadership of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So we the after Pentecost and the establishment of the church, you read in Peter, 1 Peter, that he referred to Christ as a living stone who was rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious as the cornerstone, as the reference stone. Peter also referred to followers of Christ as living stones being built up in a spiritual house. Living stones are dynamic, ever-changing. Churches, therefore, are dynamic. So it's all about change. So whether you want to say churches are against change or churches promote change, churches change no matter what. Because it's all about change. Uh, because no one's, no one's static. No one's static. They're not supposed to be. So we progress in our sanctification. We create new disciples, the Holy Spirit does, and these disciples then are developed into mature, productive disciples that go on and minister. So in the selection and shaping then of living stones is the local church is God's work. It is God who selects the stones. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, the delusion of individual autonomy is lifted, and the disciple of Christ becomes increasingly, increasingly knowledgeable of God's sovereignty. 
Due to this awareness, one is made aware of one's sinfulness and God's holiness and embraces his gift of salvation. Because God is infinite, the Christian has the ability to act freely as perceived in the realm of the finite. Therefore, Christians have the ability to act freely, yet not outside the determinative will of God. All this thing is that the church is God's work. And the only way we function in a church is because God gives us the power to do that. God gives us the ability to do that. And so we renounce any claim on any kind of sovereignty we might have. And yet, we do this on our own free actions. We do it on our own free will. But it's God who gives us the power to choose. And he gives us a heart to choose. That is an act of the Holy Spirit. So that churches who recognize this and churches who are most successful in being change adaptable realize that Greg and God is sovereign. So it's God's work and what God instructs that we do uh, as the most effective way of making disciples. The Christian then is God's workmanship. Ephesians 2.10 The main function of the local church is not evangelism, although evangelism is important. Okay, I want to make sure you understand what I'm saying here. Evangelism is vital, but it's not what we're commanded to do. We're commanded to make and develop disciples. That's the church's primary mission. So the main function of the local church is making the deceptive and developing disciples of Christ. Churches must provide an environment that, can, that encourages progressive sanctification. Every member in a local body of Christ needs to be encouraged to be involved in a ministry. Church leaders are to enable their members to minister. So the church is God's work, or it works as well through the acts. Of the to be obedient in effectively making disciples, the local church must be willing to periodically change our ministries. So that the gospel is readily understood. All change must follow scriptural principles. Gospel must remain the gospel. Churches must be willing to change biblically. And the heart of successful change navigation is effective communication. Any questions on that? Where we get into the literature review, and this is where I developed my theoretical model from these, uh, this literature, and it covers a wide variety. First of all, I wanted to do research on what, what makes a church transformational. How do you describe a transformational church? A missional church. And then also look at like, some ecclesial change models and also some organizational change models. So churches need to be transformational. Churches need to be culturally responsive to be able to do that. Churches must stay true to biblical imperatives. Churches may, must be purposeful in making and developing disciples. Church leaders must encourage and enable personal ministry in congregational involvement. So it's, it's best to encourage that balance. It's, it's, we encourage personal ministry where you're, you either have a ministry project that you're doing 
or you're just looking for open doors to evangelize, to tell people the good news. And then the, their congregational involvement would be, how are you linked into a church and how are you involved with a local church? What has God given you to do? So in the specific work, we have the attributes of a local church was written by uh, Edward Clink, or that covers the attributes of a local church. A local church is created for the pleasure of God. Local church, churches are of the people of God. Local churches manifest the presence of God. Local churches recognize God as their sole source of power and authority. Local churches proclaim God to the world. Local churches are agents of God's common and special grace to the world. Local churches carry out the purpose of God. Individuals called out of the world to show the world the working hand of God. And then with Craig Ott, I actually wrote a book uh, specifically on what a transformational church is. So local church is a transformational community, transforming Christians from progressive to sanctification, maintaining a transformative influence upon the surrounding community. Being transformed to discern God's norms and values is contrasted to God's to society's norms and values. It's never truer than today. And getting truer where there is getting to be a marked difference in the values that a biblical church has contrasted to the values of society and how we minister according to that. <clears throat> Transformational churches are Christ to the world by the power of the Holy Spirit for the glory of God. Transformational churches value, study, and apply God's word. Transformational churches seek avenues and opportunities to form all groups of people of the redemptive work of Christ. Transformational churches multiply. They experience spiritual and numerical growth. A transformational church is change adaptable. And we'll bring some clarity to what Change adaptable, change adaptable is. So in acquiring change adaptability, uh, one of the examples of a change model is by Bert Strauman's Futures. So he has a model that he, of which F is bring people to participate in change, preparing people for change, in enabling them in the change process. You then is for uniting people around needs, needs within the church body, and then the community and the driving force are the driving force of change. T is the tie innovations to mission and values. U is to use the input of legitimatizers, congregational gatekeepers, opinion leaders, individuals that need to be to be change advocates for change to succeed. And what they're doing here, what he's advocating, is to build a broad support base for the change. And so we'll get more into that in a little bit here. Rally broad ownership, in other words, building your base even broader uh, for change. Engage in action is the E. Change leaders are to ch lead change until it is incorporated. Yes, to sustain innovation as long as it takes, adjusting as necessary. So example two is one from uh, Tom Rayner. Uh, has an eight-step model. And uh, this came from a book, I think, Who Moved My Pulpit? Some of you may have read that book. Stage one, stop and pray. Pray for the wisdom to effectively navigate change, for courage and care in leading change, and strength, stamina, and the will to follow through. 
present a need for the urgency of change, change preparation, and the need for action. Stage three, build an eager coalition of supporters. The change leader needs to become a voice of and vision, a voice of vision and hope, sure of direction, encourages followers, and seeks proof of success. Dealing with people, stage five, loving those involved, anticipating and dealing with those opposed to change, navigate change with care. Move from an inward to an outward focus while not neglecting those within the church body. So in other words, uh, one of the prime problems that a lot of churches have is that they are too inward focused. They have their community set up and they're very comfortable with that community when they should be ministering to the surrounding community and having an impact and making a difference in the community around them. So there needs to be a balance. Otherwise, how do you make disciples if you don't look for them or go out and find them? And so this is a, a, a prime component of a church that is growing and their church is transformational. <coughs> Step seven, stage seven, capitalize on false small victories. So as your change progresses, you want to look for encouragement for the benefits of that change. Consolidate the change. The goal of change should be So of the organizational changes, one of the prime groupers in organizational change model and change theory is John Cotter. And some of you may have read his works as well. So in leading change then, he says he advocates for creating a sense of urgency, to create a guiding coalition, change supporters, a change team, change leaders. Now you're beginning to see a pattern here. Change directed by vision and effective communication of that vision. Elements of effective change communication. And these elements are key communication, simple, clarity. Use communication aids, visuals, examples, analogies. Communicate using multiple forms, meetings, email, letters, bulletins. Keep repeating the message. Lead by example. Provide open communication, informative, also receptive, bi-directional communication. Make communication, again, bi-directional, overcoming change barriers, structural empowerment system, structural meaning, what is your hierarchy? Uh, how do you, is your hierarchy, is your structure, organizational structure hindering change or is it helping change? And then empowerment, how are we empowering the people most affected by the change? So how do you get them to do new things? And, and how do you work with those individuals? And this is very important in a church because when we change ministry, change ministry format, then it's really important for the leaders to work with, and that, and that in, in the case here is ministry teams. Um, so you have teams of minister that minister how do you work with them to uh, to implement change, to get to see, have them see the new way of doing things? How beneficial is that? Identify short-term wins again. Yeah. Persevere to the advantages are well demonstrated. Make sure the change is secure, and then. Uh, we're going to review Everett Rogers. This is basically uh, a work that my theory is largely based on, uh, and it's tuned to a, a ecclesial change, church change. And so I've incorporated a lot of elements of various sources, and then reconstructed those elements uh, to produce a model. So it's Part my work, part their work, uh, the various sources that I, that I employ. So Everett Rogers, in his diffusion of innovations, uh, 
And then social aspects, what are the social aspects of change? So how do you introduce change into a particular society? So what change innovation is anything that is perceived by those experiencing change as new, a new alternative, method, or item. Innovation communication is essentially a social process in which subjectively perceived information about a new idea is communicated. The meaning of an innovation is thus gradually worked out through a process of social construction. An example of this is, if you remember some time ago, how many have ever heard of the Dvorak keyboard? No? When computers first came into being, late 80s, mid 80s, there was an engineer who researched out finger movements and um, people that use keyboards. And they found out that the QWERTY keyboard was inefficient, that you could actually pick up speed by going to the Dvorak key method. However, the QWERTY key system, which was adopted to a computer keyboard from the typewriter was so entrenched in the culture that the change never happened. They just, the people learned to type QWERTY, they weren't willing to type Dvorak, and so Dvorak disappeared. And so this is a really good example of how you have to make a change as culturally contexted as you can. And this goes for ecclesial change as well, church change, is how do you mold this change and still have it uh, as part of your vision, but mold it to the culture of the church. So it's rather important. And uh, we will stress that, and it'll be a little bit clearer later on as we progress. Refusion that the process of change implementation is a process by which an innovation is communicated through certain channels over time among the members of the social system. So Rogers has four main elements of the change diffusion process. The one is the innovation, the change itself being communicated and implemented. Communication channels, means of informative information exchange the duration of change from its introduction to when it is accepted by the majority of the members of the social system. The social system itself to which the change is introduced and communicated. So then the five characteristics of an innovation then is the relative advantage of the in innovation. So why, what benefit is it? The compatibility of the in innovation, the perceived advantage of an innovation according to existing values, past experience, and needs of potential adopters. Complexity, the more complex and least understood innovations are, the slower they are adopted. Uh, we call that a learning curve. Right? So if you have a steep learning curve, it's not as readily adopted. So the simpler the better if you can communicate Simple concept, very advantageous. The degree to which an innovation may be tested, so how do you determine short-term wins? What is a triability? Observability, improved results that are clearly tied to the innovation. So you have then the communication channels as a name by which messages get from one individual to another. So the actual communication route, the composition of the information exchange relationship between individuals determines the quality of communication of the innovation. Mediums of information exchange are as many as technology allows. Most individuals evaluate innovation subjectively. Peer-to-peer -peer dialogue, the effect of this dialogue depends on the two main elements of the peer-to-peer -peer relationship. The quality of such relationships, relationships is expressed in degrees of heterophily and homophily. Homophily is a, 
where elements or is elements of sameness of individuals and heterophilic are elements or is elements of differences of individuals. So the more the same a person is to the social body that he's trying to communicate change to, the more the more there is the element of familiarity, the greater the success and the speed of the change. Um, with familiarity comes trust. So if you have familiarity and that is presented with integrity, um, then that goes a long ways because it reduces the uncertainty of the innovation because you're trusting in the communicator to communicate something that's in your own best interest. Then there's the element of time. The first aspect, innovation decision process, the span of time between awareness and the acceptance or rejection of the innovation. The second aspect, when the individual or group adopts innovation in relation to other groups of the same social system. Third aspect, the rate of adoption of innovation in a social system. And the diffusion decision process which is you have knowledge, you have persuasion, and you have acceptance or rejection, implement, implementation if it is accepted, and then confirmation when it actually becomes embraced, used, and then becomes part of the culture of the society. So the innovation decision process and the adopter categories, you have the innovators, these are the first group of people that would accept a new idea. And you have early adopters. They follow the innovators in accepting the innovation. They need a little bit more information, a little bit more cautious. And then you have the early majority uh, represent the societal turning point in an innovation. It's interesting. I don't know if you've ever noticed this. Uh, no doubt you have. It's when you have a great performance and people are clapping like crazy. Then do you notice this popcorn thing with standing innovations? Not everybody stands at once normally, right? Two or three, right? And then two or three more. And then a dozen here, a dozen there. That's a perfect example of, of what we're talking about as far as early adopters, early majority. And then, after a while, when most people are standing, you don't want to feel awkward, right? So you stand too. <laughs> and, and, and so then everybody eventually stands. And so there is this peer pressure thing going on. Like, okay, that, it must be pretty good. If, if so-and-so is doing it, and so-and-so is doing it, and this person is doing it, it must be better. And then, if a lot of people are doing it, you think it must be great. And so, Change is often adopted that way, it's accepted that way. The late majority, uh, they form the remaining acceptance group. And then there are the laggards. Now the laggards may all eventually accept, or some may reject. And I'm sure we've all been in churches where there have been a few laggards that have stayed laggard a long time, and possibly never change. So the structure of the innovation process then is that you have a change agent and in ecclesial settings that's normally the senior pastor, not always but usually. And so the change agent is the one who has the initial vision, who initiates the change and starts communicating the change. And then there are change aids and these are normally more homophilous with the, with the, in this case, the congregation. So they're more familiar, better channels of communication. And of, of the many models that I've read, most of them state that the low ranger change agent isn't gonna get much done usually. They need, uh, they need support. And they need change aids 
they need people that will assist them <coughs> so that the change momentum increases. <coughs> and you have opinion leaders, leaders in the social system, whether official or unofficial, have the ability to influence the opinions of others. So opinion leaders <coughs> have quite a number of people who their opinions are respected. And so um, when the change happens, these are the people that the congregation watches. Are they going to go forward or not? And so these individuals are sought after by change aides and change, the, the uh, change agent to become advocates uh, because they become uh, a valuable ally in the change process. All right, any questions? Yeah. I'm going to ask one back at um, John Carter, the meeting, meeting change, where it creates sense of urgency, create guiding coalition, uh, change directed by vision and effective communication, I think. So you need um, to elaborate that on that is, a bit? What's that? Oh, go ahead. That, that, those three bullets are not level things. So I don't know, <clears throat> do you address that somewhat more uh, yeah. as you move through this? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. But basically, uh, a guiding <coughs> coalition, um, a lot of churches call those change teams. And so these are teams that once a, a change vision is communicated, um, and if the change is extensive, then you want to select a committee to take on change, this change. Um, and so then they would analyze and develop a change strategy is usually the whole point. So, how do you move a church through change? And, if, and it's very important to use the right strategy. Or you can stall, probably. And so you develop a strategy. The strategy is communicated to the congregation. We're telling them this is what we intend to do. And then this is where bilateral or, or, or bilateral communication is so important because you say, okay, we have an open door policy. If you have any questions on our strategy, come see any member of the, of the committee or of the, of the leaders, church leaders, elders, deacons. Um, um, I can't help but think of the failure, ultimate failure, that, that identifies to back to this thing precisely as far as I'm concerned. And that was our I don't want to get into that, but it seems to me that that is a perfect example of those bullet points. Yeah, I mean, uh, success moving forward, but we've kind of lost vision or excitement. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? And I don't want to get, that's not the first focus of this, right. but I just see how critical that can be. I mean, anybody who was around here. You could, and, 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 and small groups would be a good vehicle for communicating change. Well, I'm, I'm, not, not, even, the I'm not even wanting to refer you that up. That's not my point. My point <coughs> is if you were here during that birth of that idea and subsequent meetings and whatnot followed this almost to a T, yeah. as near as I can tell for months, several years even. But we lost vision, excitement, um, uh, people, I don't remember what it's called, uh, when 
so it can be uh, followed up by new people with the same vision, maybe with some modifications, but, uh, but we lost it in, in the process. And there were other things going on. But I, so I, my point is it just spoke to me real quick that that is so, so important to have that group of initial leaders, leader and leaders, to get that thing going. Um, well, that, that could be the aspect, you know. So, and, and I'm going to fall in one way or another. I just, I think it's right on. Yeah. So I didn't know if you touched that more going through, going forward. Yeah, well, like we're going to be touching on uh, mostly what we're, we're talking about here, of course, is communication and, and the change process. Mm -hmm. and, and so the channels of communication can be many, and one of the most valuable is peer-to-peer. -peer. Yeah. In fact, it is the most valuable element of, of, a, of the change process. <clears throat> and, and, and so how you manage that peer-to-peer -peer, uh, can be very important. Okay, uh, take a 10 minute break.
Yeah, I'm sure. Right? There you go. There's your cue. Turn rubber. <laughs> <laughs> one of the elders. <laughs> 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 okay, are we live? We're good. All right. So we are going to go into chapter four now into the study, methodology of the study. So how did I undertake the research? So on the aspects of the project then, uh, the purpose then is to identify communication methods used by evangelical churches to successfully navigate extensive change. And so extensive change would be, uh, as we get into it, like a restructuring of ministry, a redevelopment of uh, establishing ministry teams. So it's something that would take more than just a simple uh, changing of hymns or something. This is an example. So the research perspective then, again, we uh, the research method was, quali was qualitative. Uh, descriptive, ecclesial, change, diffusion, study. So it was, it, everything's written in a descriptive format, and it tells a story. And so as we get into the next chapter, it's a story of three churches. And when we get into that, uh, for uh, being anonymous or wanting to, to maintain that, then I have Church A, Church B, and Church C. Uh, and so, that way, it, it just kind of leaves it yeah, more anonymous. So the project focused in is to discover successful methods of change communication. And so to determine, so to, de 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 uh, to discover, okay, to determine the validity of a theological or theoretical change communication model that was developed by the researcher. So the project focus again is to discover successful methods of change communication and to determine whether my theoretical value uh, model was how accurate that, that is, or that was. So the research objectives then would be to determine how the select churches communicated change, to determine the degree of similarity of the church communication methods to the theoretical model, and then the third, to determine the degree of similarity of the church communication models to each other. So I want to determine if the drawing models of the churches, how similar were they to each other, and then how similar were they to the theoretical model? How far did they deviate? So the setting of the project then, is that three churches were located in the Pacific Northwest, uh, Northwest Washington State. And all three then of the selected churches navigated extensive change successfully. For Church A then, Church A is a non-denominational Baptist church. The attendance is about 160, approximately 70 families. The ethnic makeup is primarily European lineage, economically middle class English speaking. The age groups are evenly distributed. distributed. Uh, median age is about 35. And the church began in the 1950s. The church is located between two small towns of about 3,500. 
and then uh, it is also within a 15 mile radius of two large cities, one a little less than 100,000 and one at about 150,000. The church government is a council of staff and volunteer elders with a team of deacons. Uh, the ministries include worship service, biblical education, youth groups, men and women's spiritual growth groups, missions, congregational care groups, preschool, and outreach. For Church B, Church B is a non-denominational Bible church. They have about 180 attending and again about 70, roughly 70 family units. Uh, European lineage, uh, background, ethnic background, economic, middle class, English speaking. Age groups distributed fairly evenly, uh, median age about 35. Uh, the church is rather old, it began in 1920, so it's right about 100, about 100 years old. The uh, church is located in the metropolitan area of about 92,000. <coughs> church government is a council of three staff and one volunteer elder uh, with a team of deacons. Ministries or worship service, teaching ministries, youth groups, adult groups, care groups for kids, singles, couples, and retirees, uh, men and women, spiritual growth groups, missions, and outreach. Uh, the congregation also hosts a Christian school, a Christian elementary school. Church C. Is a non-denominational Bible church, about 300 attend, representing approximately 100 family units. Ethnic makeup is also European, uh, lineage, economically middle class, English speaking. Congregation is a mixture of blue collar and highly educated uh, individuals. Age groups evenly distributed, and. Uh, I got a misprint here. Uh, somehow, 1920s got in. The church is not that old. The church started in the 80s, 1980s, I believe. Uh, church is located between two cities, about 92,000 and then 15, about 15,500. Church government is a council of one staff elder and four volunteer elders. Ministries include the worship service, teaching ministries for children, adults, young adults, men and women. They have Bible studies instead of adult Sunday education. They have Sunday school for children. Their outreach ministry includes missions, uh, people without homes, shock crisis pregnancy center, and special events. So I'll put that all out here. So in the implementation of the project, there were introductory activities. So correspondence uh, was developed for each contact person uh, when I contacted the churches in the study uh, to invite them into the study to explain what my dissertation or project was about. And then there was a selection of three churches Available church documentation was obtained for each church, what, whatever was available. Interview questions developed. And then informants selected. Um, and these informants included the senior pastor of each church and then others involved in the change process. research instrument, the research instrument was developed according to the four phases of the change communication model. These four phases are the sketch phase, the model phase, the build phase, and then the modification and maintenance phase. And I'm going to explain those in detail in the next chapter. The 
in the project application, uh, then the meeting with the contact person, we met with the contact person to explain the project and an invitation to join the study. Then uh, there was a review of available church documentation that was done according to the four phases of the theoretical model. And then the data was analyzed in response to the tenets of the four phases of the theoretical model. And then in, uh, the interpretation of the data then descriptive models of change communication were developed according to the tenets of the theoretical model. Then in the data reporting, then what I looked for was a degree of similarity that the developed tenants of each phase had to the theoretical model and to each and to each other. And so I, I explained that a little bit earlier. The measurement design then, the purpose of the measurement. And again, the research question was, will models of change communication methodology of the selected churches be similar to the theoretical model developed by the researcher of this project? <coughs> and then there was one hypothesis generated, and it, and it was an answer to the research question, the model of change communication methodology of the selected churches will be similar to the theoretical model developed by the researcher of this project. Measurement design were the four phases. So in the sketch phase, an assessment has been made and this results in a vision sketch that is prepared for and presented to the church leadership. It's further, further developed with the leadership and presented to the congregation. In the model phase, then, a change implementation strategy is developed according to the vision sketch by a dedicated team or church leadership. The development of the strategy is communicated to the congregation. In the build phase, the change strategy is implemented by the leadership by those affected by the change in this process communicated to the congregation. In the modification and, mate, and maintenance, uh, modification maintenance phase, uh, the, impl the impl implementation of the effects of the change are monitored and aspects of the change modified when necessary. And so uh, and some modification and a Maintenance is where you're particularly looking and monitoring the results of the change. In the strategy of the project, again, the research question, as we said, will the models of change communication methodology of the selected churches be similar to the theoretical model? And the research question then was tested by a review of available church documentation according to the tenets of the theoretical model. And then a review of the interview data. So the questions were all formulated according to the tenets of the theoretical model as well. So these formed the, uh, the backbone, the structure of the questions that were asked during the interviews. And I tailored the interviews a little bit depending on who it was interviewing, so I would interview the pastor, and in, in one case I interviewed a secretary that was at the center of all the change correspondence, and so she proved really valuable. And so I tailored uh, some of the questions uh, to her position, but still keeping the same format, still covering the same basic tenets of the changes. So a descriptive model consisting of the four phases was developed for each church in the study. And then 
the developed change communication models for each church were compared to the theoretical model in each other to determine the degree of similarity. So any questions on chapter four? Okay, it's basically, yeah, go back to four, uh, eight percent, four and five or six. <laughs> I have a question, but I think it might get answered five or six. Oh, okay. Yeah, and now we get into, in chapter five, this is the actual uh, implementation of the project. So this is basically where I describe how the change compares to the theoretical model. So in the comparison method then, in the right of the change of each church, would, uh, each church experience was described, or the change of each, the, the change that each church experience was described. The descriptive model of each church was compared to the theoretical model for each tenant of each phase. The comparisons described a degree of similarity of first church A, then church B, and then church C. And then a second aspect or second portion was a comparative analysis with uh, the change communication models of the three churches and the study were, was done according to the tenets of each phase and the theoretical model determined the degree of similarity of the models to each other. So basically what I did was I took initially church A and then the sketch phase of church A and then compared what was, how the change was conducted in the sketch phase and all the tenets and then church A for the model stage, church aid for the build, the build stage, and then for church aid for the modification maintenance phase. And then I did the same thing for church B, the same thing for church C. And then in the second portion of the comparison was I took and, and compared all the basic tenets of each church compared to each other. So then it was A, B, and C for each tenet of the, the sketch phase. And so the sketch, that just became more of a summary. It wasn't as detailed as the initial description was when I compared just a singular church to the theoretical model. But it served to, to show points of similarity and points of dissimilarity. So the innovation for Church A then uh, was a change of ministry structure, uh, developing a council of elders and a roster of deacons, uh, developing a clear vision of being a high grace family of Christ followers who strive to live gospel-driven, God-centered lives, equipping to reach our community and the nations with a saving message of the gospel. And then the third step aligning ministry to its mission of helping people become fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. And in with that was the oversight of all the ministries by the, the Council of Elders. So, in fact, in each church that I studied, they all did that very similar. The elders oversaw and equipped as they should. That's a biblical description of an elder. Is to oversee, but guide, equip, shepherd, enable. The change for Church B was the move to a facility that would allow room for the entire congregation to worship together. And to move to a facility that would allow ministry to expand according to their purpose. Their purpose is to glorify God by making disciples of Jesus Christ. Involved in their purpose are three priorities. To worship, upward ministry to God, edification, equipping saints, the inward ministry to other believers, and then evangelism, evangelizing the lost, our power to ministry to unbelievers. For Church C, as 
the creative ministry that teaches the whole counsel of God to align the ministry to the mission, vision, statement, and to bring all ministries under the shepherd and authority of the elders. Their mission statement is we are a Christ-centered church family committed to glorifying God, teaching all of his word, and loving one another as we make disciples of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> so, in a sketch phase, in the theoretical model, the, chest, the sketch phase begins with a person acting as a change agent, usually the senior pastor, assesses the congregation to determine what change is needed to allow to fulfill this mission better. The senior pastor develops a sketch then a rough idea of what sort of change is needed. The senior <coughs> pastor introduces this sketch to the leadership. The senior pastor prepares the leadership for change by presenting reasons for it and builds a case for urgency. If the pastor is new, he begins to build relationships of familiarity and trust. <clears throat> Following the change preparation, the senior pastor presents a more developed change vision that is further developed with the leadership. Through this process, it develops the leaders into change needs. The senior pastor begins to prepare the congregation for the change. The leadership, as change aides, work with the senior pastor in communicating the vision sketch to the congregation. The objective is to inform the congregation and create opinion leaders to build a change support base. The sketch aid phase ends with the formation of a change guiding team. So for church A, the senior pastor made an assessment on the church. He presented his vision to the leadership. <clears throat> for the change which took about a year to establish relationships of familiarity and trust. This was initially, there was initially considerable resistance that was mostly centered around a staff member. He presented a more developed vision to the church leaders and with them further developed the vision. and he began preparing the congregation for the change. The sketch phase ended with the formation of the strategic planning team. So you can see the, the main tenets very similar to the theoretical model. In fact, really similar. Probably Church A was closest to the theoretical model. So Church B, Church B was a little different. The senior pastor, together with the elders, assessed the congregation and determined that more space was needed. The sketch phase was fairly brief, and it ended with the selection of the building committee to initially determine how to enlarge the existing facility. The sketch phase begin again as the building committee with the elders begin exploring options for gaining a larger facility. And this is supposed to be explained more in that model phase. The sketch phase ended with the discovery of an existing facility that was for sale. A vision was quickly developed which transitioned the elders and the building committee into the model phase. The congregation was continually informed of the process. Church C, the senior pastor had a vision of the type of church he wanted to lead, 
in the sense of church to determine if the church was a good match for his vision. So he actually did this map works from the theoretical model. Still did it, but he had a vision that he wanted to lead a church and teach the Bible expositorily and uh, go through each book of the Bible and verse by verse. And in the church he was previously at, that there were churches that there were verses that were that he couldn't they, they discouraged him from preaching because they were too controversial and so he determined that he was going to look for a church that would allow him to preach the whole word of god and so he found a church that matched his credentials that were looking for a pastor so he began meeting with them and actually had a series of meetings with this uh, particular body So before greeting the candidate, the senior pastor had a series of meetings with the church leaders to determine if this vision could be their vision and assume joint ownership. Through these meetings, the future senior pastor presented the reasons that supported this vision and further developed his vision with them. In the process, he quickly developed change aids. The sketch phase concluded when the church voted unanimously to call him as their senior pastor. According to the senior pastor, when the congregation voted to call him, they also voted for the change to be implemented. The change team was the elder board, which worked well in this type of change, as the elders are to equip the mem its members for ministry. So in the model phase, in the theoretical model, the model phase begins with the selection and action of a change guiding team. The change team comprises some church members, church leaders, other influential, influential individuals, and those familiar with the type of change considered. The change team takes the vision sketch and develops from it a change strategy. For extensive changes, a specialist might be brought in to advise the change team. So the change team regularly uh, communicates to the leadership and the congregation as the change strategy is being developed. The senior pastor continues to prepare the congregation for the changes. And then the change strategy should support the church's vision and mission statements. And I think your, your notes there should say vision and mission. It might say vision and vision. Yeah, I, I, I try to proofread and proofread that there are always something good spy. For church A then, strategic planning team developed a change strategy based on the vision sketch. And a change consultant was brought in to work with the change team at the beginning uh, to get them started. The change team regularly communicated with the leadership and the congregation as they developed a change strategy. The change strategy supported church's mission and vision statements. The senior pastor continued preparing the congregation for change. For church B, for the model phase, the change team was the building committee. So they had a committee, and initially, they were looking at enlarging their existing facility. Um, the main thing that blocked them was they are part of Lake Wacom Watershed. And because of that, they, um, there are severe restrictions to doing any kind of modifications on any buildings there. So they finally stalled and then they looked for alternatives. So they have the record that I've seen for a change team staying together for about 20 years. And 
And so they, they looked at options, and here's where uh, they were a great example of bi-directional communication. They worked according to the interviewees. The, the congregation, the leadership, and the building committee worked nearly simultaneously. There was a, a tremendous communication. And they had to do that because the, uh, the church, one of the objectives the church had was that whatever they would pursue had to be money up front. They did not want to take out a loan at all. That, that's one of their policies. So the congregation had to know how to raise money for what they were looking at doing. And so that one time they decided to start a church to uh, take the pressure off of being overcrowded. And so they started a church and that, was, that church is still going, but it was a temporary solution. They soon uh, came back uh, other members and so they were back in the same situation. They uh, looked at a, renovating a warehouse but a lot of people didn't like that idea. Uh, uh, it was not a particularly really good place in, in, in town to do that, so a lot of people were kind of nervous. So they were looking at various options when finally a uh, piece of property, actually a whole facility opened up of a church that basically uh, they bit off a bit more than they, they could chew and they wanted to get out from underneath a, a tremendous debt that they had incurred. Uh, their congregation could not support the debt loan. So it was actually a happy exchange of both parties. And this facility ended up being a total answer to prayer. It's a tremendous story of how God provided uh, a facility that's just suited this, this congregation and church being. So the building committee, together with the elders and the congregation, agreed to purchase the facility, raise the needed amount, and orchestrate the move. And so the change strategy supported the church's vision and mission statement uh, and, uh, in an uh, amazing degree. For Church C, then, <clears throat> the model phase initially occurred during the meetings that took place before the senior pastor was called. The senior pastor was with the search team and the elders communicated the strategy to the congregation. And then, when, uh, <clears throat> when they hired him to be the pastor, and about a year and a half in, <clears throat> when he started really implementing the changes of bringing all the ministry under the authority and shepherding of the elders, then a couple of ministries rebelled. And they actually took over a meeting and tried to fire him. And it, it was a meeting that was illegal, was in sanction. And so out of roughly about 160, 150, 160 individuals, um, they, uh, they were left with 50. But they started with this nucleus. God granted them elders to repopulate their elder board. And or their el yeah, I think they called them elder board. And, uh, and then to expand, and as they, as they did, they, the church will look at the changes, and they now have a fellowship with all 300. So God has blessed their efforts, and uh, they're a much more harmonious church than, uh, than they were before. So the, after the church split then, uh, so the model phase kind of went into two parts. So it was the initial model phase, and then as soon as he was hired, he went into the build phase. But then with the church split, they had to go back to the model phase because they decided to write articles of faith and clarify their doctrinal position. And so in the process, they actually developed a strategy which incorporated, which involved writing articles of faith. So they had a build phase going on with the ministries growing and being under the shepherding of the, of the elders. And then also with, the, with preaching the entire Bible and then 
the model phase was the development of the articles of faith. So when that was done and the, and the uh, model phase was complete, they were also bringing uh, elders online and informing them of the change strategy and all of incorporated the changes. And so in that, in that manner, they were being educated and then brought along. And he, they wrote his articles one at a time. So they would, he would preach on the article, they would write the article, vote on it, and then proceed to the next article. <coughs> and it took him four years to do that. But uh, it, was a, it was a great story. The change strategy supported the church's mission and vision. So you can see even though each church did it a little bit differently, the main tenets were still satisfied uh, in these phases. So we go into the bill phase. The bill phase begins when the congregation approves the change strategy. <coughs> Changes occur according to strategic plan, usually one strategy at a time. The change implementation strategy occurs jointly with those most affected. The change feedback is encouraged that all may enjoy the benefits of the change. Change implementation is often led by the change team. The implementation of the change is communicated with the church body. The change team, together with the leadership, seeks to resolve conflicts caused by change. The change team monitors the success of the change and communicated this to the leaders and the church body. Karen communicates this. The bill phase ends when the change implementation according to the strategy is complete. So for Church A, so the elders approved the change strategy instead of the congregation. However, the congregation did approve the revisions of the revision of the bylaws that made the implementation of the change strategy possible. The Elmer Board assumed control of change implementation at the beginning of the build, build phase. The strategies were implemented one at a time except for a portion of the third strategy, which included the addition of a pastor uh, leadership development. So this had to be delayed until the congregation grew to the extent where the budget allowed for an additional pastor, which they did in 2020. The implementation of the change did occur jointly as the ministry council formed into two, separate, into two separate groups of the elder council and a roster of deacons. This joint effort was seen as the elder council worked with those affected by the change as ministry teams were formed and were better aligned with the church's vision and mission statements. The congregation was regularly informed during the implementation of the change strategies. There was resistance to the development of the change strategy in the model phase that resulted in a church split. Some of the resistance carried over into the build phase. The ministry council and then later the elder <coughs> council sought to resolve these conflicts. Some were resolved, others were not. As the change continued, the church grew into a much more harmonious congregation. Early change was monitored by the deacons and elders and communicated to the congregation. The bill phase continued on another five years as elements of the change dad strategy were implemented. For Church B, the build phase began when the congregation approved the purchase of a, of a larger facility. The next thing the church did was to raise the money to purchase their property without debt, which they did in two years. Uh, two years to raise about $850,000. So that was a was an amazing provision of God. So they, they raised the money to purchase their property without debt. 
the final strategy was to move the move which took place shortly following the actual purchase. The change strategy was done one strategy at a time. And then except for the move strategy, which was involved a lot of, I guess, sub-strategies as they sought to get into the larger facility, try to determine how, what spaces could best be used by the ministries. And also they had to coordinate with the elementary Christian school that was there, which they retained. And so they had they had to share some of their facility with this Christian school. And associated with that had to be security measures to protect the children during the day. And so they would have expandable grates that would go over uh, certain portions of the day that would be open on Sunday. There would be crews that they set up uh, as a ministry to take down and then put back up. So they would take down the school stuff, put up the worship stuff, take down the worship stuff, put up the school stuff. They're, they're still doing that, uh, at least when school's in session. And so there was a tremendous opportunities to expand the ministry that way. So the, the, uh, the change strategy was done one strategy at a time. The implementation of the strategy was conducted by the building committee with the elders and the congregation involved in the purchase and move. The congregation was constantly informed throughout the process and tours of the facility were conducted prior to the purchase of the purchase agreement by the congregation so they could see firsthand what they were investing in. There were no conflicts associated with the change except for one no vote by a congregate. And according to an interview, of the senior pastor, there's always got to be some light. <laughs> <laughs> so the success, the success resulting from the move was apparent to all. There was enough space for the congregation to worship together and expand the ministry. There were additional opportunities to minister with the addition of a Christian elementary school. The build phase continued with the move and the philosophy, philosophy of ministry was written to clarify um, uh, those aspects by the elders uh, for the ministry clarification. So for Church C, the build phase began when the senior pastor was hired. The elders implemented the change strategy of aligning all ministry according to the church's mission. All ministries were placed under the direction of the elders. The senior pastor preached the whole counsel of God, just as he wanted to. The strategies listed above needed to be implemented together for it to work. So this was where it deviated, deviated from the one strategy at a time. As the changes were being implemented, resistance to the change increased. Some members of two ministries, the Ladies Bible Study and a decorating committee, were resistant to elder oversight. Although the elders sought to resolve these conflicts, some of the ladies, together with a Bell Sunday school teacher, attempted to take over a meeting to fire the senior pastor. However, they did not have authority to do this, so these individuals left together with over half of the congregation. And the second bill phase began with about 50 people, but there was no further resistance to the change. They were all on board. The elder board needed to be rebuilt and with it the creation of the articles of faith. Therefore, the model phase and the bill phase took place together as a church group. The elders were in constant communication with the congregation throughout the four years of the fall phase with the bill phase. As the church grew, the success of change was apparent in harmony in the congregation, the word of God being taught and experiencing growth from 50 to over 300 in about 10 years. The bill phase concluded with the adoption of the final article of faith and the name was changed to better reflect the mission. Okay, in a 
model modification and maintenance phase, then in the theoretical model, the change team also stays together into this phase. There is allowance for modification to the change strategy provided supports the church's mission vision. Changes continue to be monitored until they are integrated into the church's culture. There should be relationships of high trust of leaders who are passionate about progressive sanctification of each member. The result of this change is that the church is willing to undergo further changes, the ministry is benefited, and it complies with their mission. The result of the change process is a change adaptable, transformational church that has a high view of God and the Bible is obedient to the entire Great Commission. In Church A, the Elder Council oversaw the modification of the change strategy, particularly the development of the ministry teams. The Elder Council continues to shepherd the ministry teams. The congregation is willing to change, providing that is biblical aligns with the mission statement and is advantageous. The church has a high view of God and is obedient to the entire Great Commission. For Church B, the elders oversaw the modification of the change strategy as their mission ministry expanded. The elder council continues to shepherd the ministry teams. The congregation is willing to change, provided it is biblical, aligns with the mission statement, and is advantageous. The congregation has a high level of trust in their leadership. The change is integrated into the church culture to the point that they change the name to reflect their new location. The church has a high view of scripture, is obedient to the entire Great Commission, and has a high view of God. For church C, as the elders, for the change team from the beginning, they oversaw the modification of the change strategy, which mostly consisted of the development of the Articles of Faith and the addition of ministry teams. The Elder Council continues to shepherd the ministry teams. The changes have been integrated into the church culture that has reflected their main change. The congregation is willing to change provided this biblical aligns with the mission statement and is advantageous. The congregation has a high level of trust in their leaders. The church has a high view of scripture, is obedient to the entire Great Commission, and they have a high view of God. So the researchable question was, Will the models of change communication methodology of the selected churches be similar to the theoretical model developed by the researchers in the project? The hypothesis then is the change diffusion communication methodology models of each church will resemble the change diffusion communication theoretical model developed by this author. So as a result of the descriptive comparisons, there is enough similarity in the manner in which the tenets of the four phases of the theoretical model are described by the models of three churches uh, to satisfy the hypothesis. So there was uh, a great deal of similarity here, although there were marked differences in the, the order of it and how they did it. Uh, the general pattern was remarkably similar. Any questions on chapter five? So, yeah. How many years did you work with do this? Uh, <laughs> about seven and a half. Although uh, about three years ago, three and a half years ago, I actually changed my subject matter. So that's why I put it behind me. So I was trying to do a, uh, a history, but doing a history it was a history of a, a, a basically Baptist history. 
Uh, it's a little hard to do a project on that. I couldn't make one work. So I decided to take a really hard look at what, what is needful, what would be valuable for churches. And change is something we face. Every church faces that. So I decided I was going to, to produce a resource. And, and there are plenty of models on change communication, I mean, on change as far as change in ethics go, but not, a, not as many on how do you communicate that, how do you prepare uh, a congregation, how do you prepare leadership for change, even how do you announce that, how do you develop a vision, strategy, and, and so um, I decided to concentrate my study on that. Okay, we'll move on to chapter six. And this one is relatively brief. Uh, talk about conclusions and recommendations. So on the conclusion, uh, relationships of trust and familiarity are essential to effective change communication and implementation. I believe in the case of church A and church C, um, the church splits or somewhat related to uh, infamiliarity uh, to, a, to an extent um, because it takes a while for a congregation, for a new pastor to come in. There, those familiar communication channels need to be really, really established. And, and even though the change really, the change was mentioned fairly early on, I think it uh, was in about the third month. And, but it really wasn't until a year, about a year and a half later that there was a change team formed. And it was during, the actually the formation is during the model phase that the trouble started. And then with Church C, I think there was uh, it was pretty much a fast track. I mean, the, the, the sketch phase and the model phase happened really, really quick, even before the candidate. Uh, so this was, I think, there were some people that maybe just took him a little bit. But when they, just, when they saw that he was serious about bringing everything under the authority of the elders, that's when the rebellion started. But all three churches, uh, from the research I've done on them, are, are are amazingly harmonious, and all three of them are, are amazingly similar in the fact that uh, they have a high view of God, they have uh, a high view of sovereignty of God, they have uh, just a, a, a high view of, of uh, the discipleship every church uh, focuses on. All three churches study focused on the discipleship method and how we develop, and we can develop disciples. So the relationship of trust and familiarity, um, that all, the, all the pastors I interviewed, every one of them said, it's incredible. If, 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 if they can introduce change, if they, if they see it's biblical and advantageous, they're right behind the pastor. So those trust relationships are really established. Church B had the smoothest transition just because the pastor was there for 20 years before this change took place. And so those relationships were well developed. And he had proven through his integrity and his care for the congregation uh, in that long track. Uh, they were, uh, it was a very smooth transition for them, even though it took 20 years to really find a solution. The second conclusion, churches that successfully navigate change tend to develop ministries that align well with their mission statement and ministry process. And because when you have a smooth ministry process, that becomes an excellent channel for change and change readiness. Now, the project churches communicate change similar to the theoretical model and therefore were similar to each other. So in this conclusion, uh, the third conclusion, conclusion, the sketch phase is essential to establishing direction, urgency, and support initial change communication. Change modeling is important. 
to the change implementation process where a change strategy is developed and communicated. Change implementation feedback is crucial to the success of the innovation process. In a modification and maintenance phase, change adaptability occurs when churches are successful at change and culturation. And so when the change becomes embedded into the culture of the church, where they say, this is how we do things here, then that, 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 that is where the change is settled. But more important than that, when you establish that acculturation, you also are trying to acculturate a change readiness. Are you ready for the next one? What's the next vision? And, and so all three churches were successful in doing that. recommendations then, recommendations for changes in this project would be perhaps a more thorough study of each church. Uh, there's always more to learn. There's more to the story. Uh, more churches need to be studied to investigate degrees of variance. So that would be something that uh, you could do uh, amongst many things. Recommendations for researchers of similar projects then would be a case study approach and look at it at change experience from more varied points of view uh, would have value. And then recommendation for additional research in this field of study. Uh, more qualitative descriptive studies of change communication methods of other churches. Perhaps those of the denomination would prove beneficial uh, because Denominations in the hierarchy uh, involved with denominations just add an extra step uh, that you would have to deal with the change implementation. You know, how free, depending on how free each denomination is with their, with their churches. Uh, more stories of successful change implementation need to be told to encourage other churches to change biblically to better accomplish the great commission of Jesus Christ. And then recommendations for institutions of ministry development teach uh, change methodology that biblically responds to cultural changes might be of value. And perhaps that is in some curriculum, I don't know. Uh, would be a recommendation. Recommendation for pastors and ministry leaders. If the pastor is new to a church, it's important to establish relationships of familiarity and trust before change is mentioned unless urgency is needed. Uh, in the case of church seat where the pastor wanted to teach the, the whole, whole council of God, that's pretty urgent. You're, you're going to want to do that. And, that, and so there, there would be exceptions to that. It's important to prepare the leadership and in the congregation for the change proposal. For extensive changes, the development of a change team may be helpful. The change considered should work well with the established culture of the church. Okay, that's, uh, that concludes the uh, Chapter six. Uh, any further questions? Uh, my answer, or you provided the answer for the question I had before, uh, which didn't surprise me. I, overall, with the three ABC churches, um, it sounded like, if I was hearing correctly, um, uh, a lead pastor, senior pastor, or Terminology they used seemed to be the critical element in those examples. Um, whereas I had me put ours into that mix for churches like us, where our uh, leadership is a plurality of elders, including the teaching pastor. Well, uh, church, and so I didn't pick up. On that in A, B, and C. 
So not that that's good or bad, it's just observation. Uh, more studies, more profile, church's profile would probably <coughs> add that mix, add to the mix, correct? Yeah, I'm, uh, that, that's why there's a couple of clauses <coughs> in there uh, where the change agent could be somebody other than the senior pastor. Uh, actually, Church B, I believe, they <coughs> uh, their preaching pastor, the lead pastor, and so he's not called a senior pastor as such. And and so in, in churches where you have uh, a plurality concept, where you have pastors, say, that take turns preaching, then you would have to sort out uh, who is going to instigate change or, in, or introduce change and why. But then it's really important Yes, the change agent, uh, the senior pastor or Lorex, the change agent is is essential, but it's it's, uh, it's just important to have backers, and and so the, the the one who leads the change needs to adequately communicate change and develop the leadership of the change agents. That's critical um, because if you don't have backers, it's not going to go anywhere. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. My question in four had to do with. Um, it sort of goes back to this question uh, was whether you would need to bring someone from the outside or if you do all of this internal and, and in five it basically said yes <laughs> it could be both it could be either or yeah. it depends on the situation that's why I got it up yeah. interestingly enough church A was the one only one that in my study who did that. Uh, yeah, the other two, uh, Church B, the only outside agent they used was a lawyer to draw up a real estate contract. Mm -hmm. And uh, Church C was, uh, they didn't bring specialists in at all. In fact, they almost did everything. But that made sense in their application because they have a ministry, not a ministry, well, they have a ministry restructure. So the, el the structure of the elders was already there. Right. But they had to actually uh, become biblical in their expression of, of, of what they what they were doing, and and so it was on paper. In fact, I talked to a senior pastor, and he said the doctrine on paper looked good, but because the church was a merger between two churches of different doctrinal backgrounds, different doctrinal statements, that they de-emphasized doctrine to the point where when people would join, they would say, don't, don't uh, pay any regard to the doctrinal statement. Uh, we'll bring you in. That's always dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> always dangerous. Oh. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Uh, we will conclude uh, this presentation. Uh, thank you very much.